Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. If it's your first time with us, uh, I want to welcome you. I hope tonight uh, is a blessing to you. And if so, I hope you become a, a regular participant. Not only Wednesday nights, but we have a Sunday live broadcast. That's 5 p.m. Eastern time. We have a church service. Uh, I hope you'll uh, join us every Sunday. If you haven't joined us yet, check it out. Uh, now, let me ask before we get started with the study of Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 1, let me ask Brother Cripps to introduce himself to anybody who may not already know you, Brother. Tell them who you are and what you're doing here on YouTube. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps, and I am part of a channel called True Story Live that comes on Sunday at 9. So appreciate that, Brother Luke. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm on a number of other broadcasts. Uh, just I fill in sometimes, but I'm uh, Brother Luke asked me to be a part of the Wednesday night broadcast, which I was uh, very interested in. And so we get a chance every week to go through the Bible and to fellowship with the chat. And it's always a pleasure. Hello to everyone. Yes, thank you. Hello. I see everyone. Um, thank you so much. And um, I look forward to another good study. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Okay, then, uh, by the way, uh, uh, if, if you're a regular participant, uh, you're probably expecting to see Sister Renee. She's with us uh, on these Wednesday night Bible studies, and I got a bunch of messages from her just over the last half hour, and unfortunately, her um, chronic health problem is flared up. And not only is she dealing with the pain, but the medications that she's taking, sometimes the cure is worse than the problem. The side effects she's dealing with are very, very hard for her. And so she will not be with us tonight, unfortunately. So let's uh, make sure that everybody prays for Sister Renee. And she's always in our prayers, but especially right now. Uh, I did send a link to uh, Brother Steve, a uh, uh, soldier for... Christ, we are at war. Is his YouTube channel? Uh, so perhaps he'll join us if he if he becomes aware that I've sent him a link because he, he's not a regular participant, but he's agreed to fill in when needed. So hopefully he will be able to join us at some point tonight. If not, uh, I'm sure we'll see him at some point in the future. Um, okay. Um, all right, brother. Um, well, I guess the, the only other thing I want to say before we get into the text is um, if uh, if you have not been watching these studies uh, since the beginning, I, I hope you will go back and watch uh, the study of the Pauline epistles. We're beginning, going right in order, starting with Romans. We'll work our way through all the Pauline epistles, but we've done already five chapters. And particularly the, the very first study, uh, uh, which served as an introduction to the studies and, and uh, the, the second one, which we introduced an idea called prosopopoeia. Um, I'm not gonna try to teach you what that means tonight, but uh, if you will go back, especially watch the first two programs uh, on the book of Romans, uh, it probably will be very, very helpful so that as we continue on, uh, you'll have that as a foundation. Um, okay. I would just add to that, that they're really, really excellent studies. And there's a lot of good material as well as um, if you're the kind of person that enjoys uh, watching the chat, there's um, always good conversations going on in there too. Because the people on this channel, they do try to uh, pay attention to what's going on. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things people talk about too, but we always like you to um, uh, just follow along with us and make comments. And uh, uh, Brother Luke will always uh, come to the chat and um, see what everyone has to say. If you have any questions or comments, definitely put them in the chat for us. Yeah, all right, thank you. Uh, that reminds me about the chat room. Uh, there's two things I want to mention again uh, to the congregation in the chat room. One is if you do have a question as we go through the study tonight, or if you have a, a statement that you'd like us to respond to, uh, please shout at me. You know, how you shout in, in chat, you put it on all caps. If you put it in all caps, 
uh, I'll notice it. And uh, it, that's the, how you can get my attention. So questions or comments that you want a response, please make them in all caps. Uh, the other thing is if you're a moderator and most of the regular participants here do have a moderator uh, status, uh, let's be on the lookout for trolls. And uh, if anybody is uh, in the chat room and you are, um, uh, if you want to disagree with either anything that we say or anybody uh, in the chat room, if there's a disagreement, that's fine. You don't have to agree. But uh, we do ask that when you do disagree that you go out of your way to be polite about it. And uh, that way we have a, uh, an environment in the chat room that is uh, charitable and uh, that, that's what we have and that's what we want to keep. Okay, so beginning with Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Okay, so he's uh, starting off with two questions. And uh, there's two important things about his, this technique of using questions. But let me get your, uh, your thoughts first, Brother Cribs. Uh, do, you, uh, do you want me to go first uh, and you respond? Or do you want to go back and forth? Or how do you have any preference? No, uh, I don't have a preference. Just uh, you lead the way and I'll follow. No problem. Okay, well, let me give you some thoughts on, on verse 1 and 2. And, uh, you, you notice that Paul is asking a question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So why is a question being asked? Um, it's, it's a rhetorical technique. One, in, in one respect, you know, you've heard the... <laughs> you heard the uh, concept of a rhetorical question. Sometimes the question is asked not even expecting an answer, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just a, a technique to make a point. But in this case, Paul asks the questions here, and he asks questions in many of his epistles because he has been questioned. He has been challenged in with these questions in his ministry. So he's presenting to us the questions that either his accusers or the false teacher, teachers who pursue Paul wherever he goes, trying to, uh, you know, um, harm his churches, uh, accusing Paul of being a, a false apostle, accusing Paul of teaching that uh, uh, you're not required to follow the laws of Judaism. Of course, that is what Paul said. He says we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to follow the laws of Moses. You don't have to give animal sacrifices at the temple. So Paul is a primary contribution to the church is teaching us that not only are we saved because we believe in Jesus, but you dare not mix any religious works with our salvation, with our gospel. Otherwise, you've spoiled it and it has no value. And because he teaches that, he comes up uh, under a lot of scrutiny from all the other, uh, you know, uh, let's call them Judaizers uh, or false teachers, that they insist that faith in Jesus is not enough, that you've got to also practice Judaism. So in the beginning of the church, the problem was that many, uh, most people believe that in order to be saved, uh, you had to be a Jew. They didn't know that uh, Christ came for the whole world and salvation is offered to everybody. They thought it was exclusively for Israel. And eventually they realized that no, Gentiles are to be included, but that wasn't until 10 years after Pentecost. That was the first Gentile to be saved was Cornelius and Peter was given a message to the Lord to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, and then the other the other uh, problem that had to be corrected is not only did they think this was only for Israel and the Jews, but they thought that you must be, if you were a Gentile, you had to convert to Judaism. You had to get circumcised. You had to practice Judaism too. So these are the two things that Paul really is uh, uh, designated to correct, that the gospels for Jews and Gentiles and uh, Judaism has to be discarded. You can put no faith in your religion at all. Uh, so laying that as a foundation, this is why Paul 
is uh, using, instead of just making a statement, he's asking it in the form of a question, because these are the questions that are asked about Paul in an accusatory fashion. So laying that as a foundation, your brother, tell me about verse one and two, as you say. Yeah. That was an excellent setup. Thank you for that. So uh, uh, the first one, what shall we say then? I, when I, I Again, what I love about Paul is I can almost hear him, um, as you pointed out on an earlier broadcast, you know, this is him speaking to a group of people. And there's lots of mechanisms back then. Again, they didn't have TV and movies. So uh, when you're speaking to a group of people, you can imagine it being animated. You can imagine him using inflection. You can imagine him um, using different tones. So this first party, what shall we say then? You know, it, it, you know, in modern day terms, it's like, how are you supposed to react to this? You know, he's sharing uh, exactly like Brother Luke was saying. He's, he's sharing this idea. Uh, he set it up very well. So how are we supposed to react to this? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Um, what that means to me is uh, now that we have grace, now that we've been forgiven, now that Christ has died and resurrected, are we to continue in the same things that we used to do before we realized that he gave his life to save us all from, from the uh, consequences of sin? No, no, God forbid. In other words, Father forbid. How shall we, we that have been saved and we're dead to sin, in other words, the, dead, the, the old man is, is crucified with Christ, how can we continue to live in that any longer? Uh, we can't, <laughs> we can't, um, once we've realized that we were, we were bought with a precious price and it's already been paid, uh, we have no more debt to the law and we have no more responsibility to sin. Um, lovely, lovely couple of verses. Good start. Thank you. All right. Um, so I believe that book of Romans is one of the most important books in the Bible. And, Agreed. And I think there is great value to be uh, gained from it. But I also worry that many people take many portions of the book of Romans and uh, because maybe it is a stumbling block. Mm. Maybe it is written in a way to be a stumbling block to those people who don't have Humility, because Jesus says, you uh, if your heart's not right, you know, he spoke in parables. So if your mm. heart wasn't right, you wouldn't be, you'd be confused and wouldn't understand it. Yes. He wants you to have a humble heart as you approach the scriptures. And if you don't come into the scriptures with this attitude, then you're going to uh, misunderstand a lot of things. So there are a lot of false conclusions and false doctrines that mm -hmm. people get from the book of Romans. And as we go through, we'll... We'll uh, show you as we go along. But here is the, uh, we're, we're looking at the idea that, well, why is he even addressing this? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, brother, uh, this problem did not only exist uh, in about, let's say, 50 AD, right. when this was r roughly written, but this problem has persisted through all the centuries of the church, and it certainly persists today. And that is the accusation against all of those like us who mm -hmm. agree with Paul on the, the gospel. The, there is an accusation against Paul and us mm -hmm. that we are telling people sin is not an issue. Don't worry about that at all. No big That's deal. Right. Sin. Go sin all you want. Go marry right now. You can sin even more than you ever did before. Feel free to sin all you want. And so have you. Have you ever had anybody accuse you of that in your in your message saying you're just giving people a license to sin? Brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's pervasive, actually. It's it's people accusing us. I mean, you know the terms, and I won't even mention them because it's so irritating. Um, but they use these these uh, cheap throwaway terms to describe uh, the grace that we have in Jesus Christ, and it's because well you. It's for a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons is, is because they look at themselves, and they look at their own works, and they feel righteous by them rather than on the only thing that we can feel righteous about, and that's Christ righteousness. Um, and so they want to point the finger at us if they see us, especially if they see um, one of us uh, doing something they consider to be a sin. They just think that it's a license to sin, as you said, 
and that we're just going out there just, oh, no problem. You know, you know, God's not going to convict me of my behavior, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to live the way I want. So, yes, the answer to that, the, the short answer is absolutely I've heard that being said. Uh, more to uh, brothers and sisters that um, that, that uh, pound, pound these uh, topics more than I do, um, but I've heard it in my own life as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when people uh, make accusations against you today, if you're uh, preaching the gospel, mm -hmm. the, the true gospel <clears throat> about salvation being a free gift, mm -hmm. not of works, eternal life being guaranteed, irrevocable, you can't mm -hmm. lose it. True gospel message. There are people who are going to do the same thing to us today that they were doing to Paul in his time. They accuse us of being false teachers yep. and accuse us of, of um, um, saying, well, law, sin, don't worry about that. Yep. Sin all you want, so grace can even get more grace. But yeah. Paul says, God forbid, yes. regarding this subject. So that's, he's saying, that's not what we're saying at all. Mm. How many times have I had to say to everybody, that's not what we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me any any preacher today who's preaching the real gospel message, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and then that they're actually encouraging people to sin. No, we discourage no. people to sin, but we're doing the same thing Paul did. He's saying that sin is, and your ability to get sin out of your life has nothing to do with you getting eternal life as a gift. Mm-hmm. It doesn't factor into it in any way. No. But he also says, God forbid, we're not, don't get the wrong impression. We're not encouraging people to sin because if you sin, sin cause, does come with its own consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me read this in the Amplified. Please. See how it's phrased. <laughs> what shall we say to all this? Now, of course, that is. He, the, the reason they're saying that is because they're uh, wanting us to look back at chapter 5 and, and say, what, what shall we say to all this that we said earlier in chapter 5? Should we continue in sin and practice sin as a habit so that God's gift of grace may increase and overflow? Certainly not. How can we, the very ones who died to sin, continue to live in it any longer? So um, that's how it's uh, amplified. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, if you're new here to our studies, um, by the way, if you are new, I hope that everybody in the chat room, moderator and stuff, if you see someone new, please extend a, uh, go to your way and, and make sure they are welcome. Um, but if you're new, you may not be aware of it. Um, I think pretty much either all or most of the people in our congregation, we use the KJV uh, as our scripture. Right. But myself and many others uh, uh, take the liberty of looking at other translations. But we, we, I personally, I compare it to the KJV because the KJ, KJV takes precedent over any of the others. If, right. if I read another translation, and it's clearly stating something different than the KJV, then I have to reject the other translation. Yeah. But sometimes the, the other translation can shed a little more light on it and maybe put it in a, in a modern English that is uh, maybe easier to understand, especially for someone who's not experienced with the KJV in this ancient English. Right. Okay. Uh, now let's go a little bit further um, into... Uh, uh, verse 3 in the KJV says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Here's another question mark. Yep. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so the first one, know you not that so many of us were baptized. That's that's all of us that have been saved were baptized into Jesus Christ. Um, 
were baptized also in his death. So as as Christ died in the the part which he came to do, which was be God in flesh, and that that flesh part was crucified and was buried. Um, that's the same thing for us. We're crucifying the old man. We're crucifying the sinful man, just just as well as Jesus did. So we're buried with him. He makes that clear in verse 4. We are buried with him by the same baptism into death. So that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So this is the new man. This is the spirit man that we get. When the Holy Spirit quickens our dead uh, dead spirit and makes us alive again with the Holy Spirit, and we walk in that every day, and that's newness of life. That part of us will never die. That part of us lives on forever. We'll get a new body when this when this flesh, um, either Christ comes back or uh, we go through the natural processes of this life, of this sinful world, and the flesh will die, but the spirit in us will never die because of what Christ gave to us, because we're baptized uh, into the, the newness of life. I love that last phrase, Brother Luke. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. That's what we've been given. So if we're walking in newness of life, we don't have to worry about the, the sins. We don't have to worry about the old man. But we do have to contend with him because while we are in this realm, and I'm sure Brother Luke will get to that eventually uh, in, in the passages, but um, we still have to carry this flesh suit around with us. And uh, we have to choose every day to, to walk in the newness of life, in the spirit that we've been baptized into, and not take up the old things again of the old man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, uh, how many verses now are there with question marks? We've, got, <laughs> uh, we've already got uh, one, two, three, four. Each one of these verses, in verse six, has two question marks in it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, verse, verse one, verse two has yeah. a question mark. Verse three begins with a question mark. Uh, yeah, so it's a technique that Paul's using, and, and uh, it's to make you think. And also, it's, it's, I think this is also a, a kind of a, a prosopopoeia light, mm -hmm. is that he's he's presenting something in a question the way that he would be questioned by the false teachers. Right. So he's presenting the, 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 the concepts that people are using against him, the false teachers that are following him around. And then he's, so he's presenting both sides of it. He's saying, this is what they're saying. C consider this in, in the form of a question. And then he's saying, no, God forbid. That's not what we're saying at all. Um, but, uh, Know ye not that, that so many of us, as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Well, you know, I've talked about this recently. Uh, I've talked about it many, many times, but the word baptize. Um, um, I think that the word baptize is one of the probably the top five words in the Bible that is misused, misunderstood, misapplied. Okay. Um, because the default for almost everybody is that they think it's being water baptized, immersed or submerged in water when they see the word baptized. Mm -hmm. we, we need to develop the opposite uh, default. And that is every time we see the word baptize, our assumption should be that it's water is not in the picture at all. We're, we Thank you. To think about water unless the verse has the word water in it, or the surrounding context leads you to conclude that it must be water. Right. Apart from those circumstances, you should assume that it is not water, but it is spirit baptism. Um, so brother, spirit baptism, how would you define that or explain what that is? Um, I would say, again, uh, we start out with with uh, we start out as a dead man when we enter in this in, in this world into our fleshly bodies and we walk around before we um, get uh, meet the savior. We're we're basically walking dead. I, I literally get the image of a zombie uh, in my head when I think about it. That's what we are. 
Um, when we meet the Savior and we accept his uh, finished work on the cross, the baptism is that old flesh being superseded by the quickening of his spirit inside us. Um, I don't think that's too deep to grasp. I think it's uh, pretty easy to understand. So in trying to get away from the idea of water where someone is is put under the water and then when they come back up, it washes away uh, washes away that part and they and they come out of the water a new man. So without the water, it's the same thing. We were dead to sin and then we become alive through Christ Jesus. So that that process to me would be the baptism from death into life, instead of it using the term water from death into life. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's exactly the way a person should think of the word baptize. Uh, not it's not talking about water; it's talking about as Brother Cripps said, the Spirit of God bringing our spirit to life. It's like. It's like uh, the Walking Dead or a zombie. Those are good, uh, good pictures of. It. I made a video titled "There Really Are uh, Zombies." It's a good one. I did watch that. <laughs> That's a good, good one. Check that. Check that out, guys. It's pretty, pretty good. Uh, but I also want to make sure people understand that uh, I, I do not teach or endorse any component of Calvinism, and the Calvinists use the fact that the Bible says that man is dead spiritually they they um like everything else that they do wrong they uh, uh redefine what words co concepts are um, they say a dead man can't do anything but w w when i was born uh i had a, a mind or soul that functioned and i had a body that functioned mm -hmm. so uh, how is it possible that when we're all born, that we are born dead, wa the walking dead? The Bible says we're dead spiritually, yes. uh, which means that our spirit, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, uh, the spirit of God was in Adam and Eve, and the Bible tells us that because of sin, the spirit withdrew. So imagine that uh, your spirit and the, and the spirit of God are joined together, and then the spirit withdraws, so you're left with, let's call it a stub, a uh, disconnected spirit. Uh, it's kind of like um, if you're not connected to God's spirit, it's like not being plugged into the Internet. That's it. Like, yeah, it's, it's like not being plugged into your electrical socket in the wall. There is no source of power and uh, uh, knowledge or truth unless you're connected to the internet, connected to your power source. And so even though we can walk and we can talk and we can think and we can reason, see the Calvinist errors, they, they say that you're not capable even understanding the gospel or, or um, um, believing, making, uh, uh, you know, understanding well enough to understand it and believe it. It's impossible for a dead man to do that. That's what the Calvinists say. But just because our spirit is dead doesn't mean our mind is not functioning and we're able to reason and understand and believe. But the Calvinists teach that a man's spirit has to be brought to life. This is what happens with spirit baptism, as you said, brother. The, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, when we believe that Jesus is uh, our Savior and he's guaranteed us eternal life because of our faith in him, when we believe that, the Spirit of God connects to our spirit. It brings our spirit to life. Yes, uh, and when, when when this happens, uh, the Bible has this beautiful word called "quickened." We are quickened. We are yes. brought, to, brought a light to life spiritually. We are born again spiritually, born from above. The Holy Spirit picture it coming down from above and coming to our spirit and bringing us to life. But when that that happens, uh, now uh, uh, that's that's the state of every believer. But the Calvinist mm -hmm. teaches. That before you ever believed on Jesus, God randomly picked some people through no uh, system of logic or reason at all, but just randomly like rolling the dice. Right. And he uh, brings them to life. He regenerates them. He, and they get basically born again. They, their spirits brought to life. Mm -hmm. And then they have the ability to understand the gospel and believe. So they have it reversed. They think that... God randomly 
quickens your spirit or you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, even though you never believed in Jesus, you could be an atheist walking around and you can now God's regenerated your spirit. But now that your spirit's alive, you can understand and, and, and you will believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have it backwards. They think you're, you're born again or regenerated first and then you believe. And the, but the Bible tells us, no, we believe. And when we believe, then our, our spirit is brought to life. Beautiful. Uh, so that's important to understand that when we see the word baptize, that's the way we should understand it, that our spirit is brought to life. Uh, it has nothing to do with water. There you go. Okay. Then the. Uh, want to add one thing before you move on, Brother Luke, if that's okay. First of all, I loved your terminology that you used there. So it's like a dead connection. So to use the internet uh, specifically, because that's a good one. So you have you have uh, bandwidth coming through, okay. So if you've got a if you've got a internet connection and you pull the pull the plug out, you're not going to have internet service, okay. So um, using that analogy, then when you plug it back in, then you're able to to do everything you need to do. You're plugged into the source. So the source in this situation is the Holy Spirit. And when we're connected to him, then we're able to uh, live in that way and stay connected. And that's the term uh, that I love is uh, being connected to the vine. When we stay connected to the vine, we're, we're walking with him, we're connected, we're choosing to walk in the spirit instead of in the flesh, because that, that part still is a choice. We can decide as a believer, we might be saved, but we can decide wrongly to just you know, keep living as the old man. We don't have to do that, though. So as long as we stay connected, we keep that connection going, then um, then that's when we're able to live in the newness of life that we were talking about in the, in the at the end of the verse. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and at this verse, when it says that uh, uh, we're baptized into Christ, see, the word baptized... Um, I've heard it taught, and I, I think this is probably uh, a, a better way of, of uh, associating the word baptize, because when we word the, use the word baptize, as I said, almost all people, unless they have been taught otherwise, they think that you're talking about water, being submerged or immersed in water. But uh, you are being immersed. When, when we're spirit baptized, we are immersed. So think of it this way. Uh, there's the Bible says that we believe in Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, we get this gift of eternal life. But we could very easily rephrase that and say we believe into Jesus. Mm. We believe we get we become one with Christ. We be the Bible says we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. So we are immersed. Christ and our spirits are immersed together. And so rather than baptize, if we think of it as being believing into Christ, be, our spirits being immersed in, in with the spirit of God, um, then, uh, but it says we're baptized into his death. Well, baptized into his, his death is that uh, the experience that Christ had, his suffering and death on the cross, we know that he took our place. But we should also understand is that we died with him on the cross because we are in Christ. It's like, uh, you know, trying to understand time and uh, how all these things, like how could I be um, here, but I'm also presently seated in heavenly places. Yes. Uh, these concepts uh, are mind boggling for <laughs> now. Um, whenever I watch sci-fi movies and they're about time travel, it twists my mind into a pretzel trying to keep up with it all. But the point is that somehow, about 2,000 years ago, you and I, we also died on that cross with Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know how God manages it with the, working with, it, with time, but the Bible does tell us that we died with Christ. And that's what it's, it's saying here. We were baptized in his death. Um, then it says, so be, because Christ died in our place and we were with in Christ and we died along with him, 
the sentence of death now is removed from us because the Bible says that we are all under a sentence of death. This is not talking about the, the, the death that we all have after 70 or 80 years. This is talking about the second death after the judgment uh, called the second death, uh, the lake of fire. We are spared that. We don't have to suffer the second death. The death sentence is removed. Yes. Christ paid for our death, and we died along with Christ. So uh, there's no need to give us this uh, uh, second uh, second death when it's already been accomplished. That's it. Um, Beautiful. Then we um, then verse four says, "Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death." Uh, now, here's a way of looking at baptism that would be uh, appropriate uh, if you're going to think in terms of water is that um, when we are submerged in the water at a baptism, it's as though that we have died and been buried with Christ. When you raise up out of the water, it's uh, the resurrection. So it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, of which we share because it says, it says here that we are buried with him by baptism into his death. So we share in that experience so that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. But the water baptism does serve a purpose. and You don't have to be water baptized ever, but you should be water baptized. Mm. It's it's the best opportunity a new believer will ever have of sharing the gospel with their friends and family. Yes. Hey, um, go to your pastor and say, I'd like to be water baptized and, and uh, set a date. And then you can invite all your friends and family, invite them to the church to uh, uh, be witnesses of your baptism. And uh, with either you or the pastor can explain the symbolic meaning behind the baptism. And what you're doing is presenting the gospel to everybody. Mm -hmm. So, if you're shy and if you don't feel equipped to present the gospel to all your family and friends, get water baptized, invite everybody to come, and they'll all get the gospel message that way. That's it. Well, we hope, depending on what kind of church it is. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do hope that. We hope. Uh, okay, uh, there's one last part of this verse before I want to talk about this word should. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So, I have a, another video I made a long time ago, probably almost 10 years ago. One of the first videos I made, because this is a long, long time problem, and that is people confusing uh, must and should. What must we do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. What should we do after we are saved? Walk in newness of life. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, should and must are not interchangeable words. They are not synonymous. They have different meanings. And they're, mm. they're uh, otherwise, if, if, if they're interchangeable, we could just say what, what must, well, you must walk in newness, but doesn't say you must walk in newness. You should. should. And that requires that you cooperate with the spirit that's living in you that oh. wants to transform your desires uh, into new actions and, uh, and you can resist it or you can embrace the spirit and when you embrace it then uh, you get transformed and there's a, a dramatically changed person amen as a result of that but this is something that we should do but not all believers cooperate that's right cooperate that's the key word. Um, gosh, Brother Luke, that was amazing. I wish more people would uh, get a chance to hear that and really take that in. So this is kind of what I was referring to earlier. This is a choice that we make to walk in newness. Um, uh, the word should is exactly what that means. So this is when you see someone that claims to be saved and you see them um, acting out or doing things that you uh, don't understand. Um, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that they aren't saved. They're not, but it very well could be that they're in those moments. They're not choosing to walk in that newness. It should. We should walk in that newness. This is the way we should live. Um, yeah. So you, you you don't have to jump to the conclusion that someone is saved or not saved. 
Um, we all have this choice to make every day of our lives. This is, uh, this is why he renews our mind every day. That's why it, it, it's not done one time. It's done every day. Every day that we wake up, we receive new mercies every day. And that's that mercy of him renewing our minds. So we are able to walk in the newness of life. It is, a, it is definitely a choice. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. I'd like to read the verse three and four in the Amplified and see how okay. it's there. Sure. Um, or are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We have therefore been buried with him through baptism into death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory and power of the Father, we too might walk habitually in newness of life. Habitually. Abandoning our old ways. Um, I like that. I like the Amplified. Yeah. Uh, habitually. Habitually is a good word. Yeah. Uh, it is. Um, <laughs> you know, even before I was a, a Christian, um, I used to study all the positive thinking books, you know, how to be successful in life. Right. How to grow rich and uh, books like that. How to win friends and influence people. Yeah. And there's a lot of wonderful principles in those books. Sure. And, and unfortunately, a, a church like Joel Osteen's church, that's really what he's doing. He's just teaching positive thinking, positive yeah. viewpoints on life and stuff. But Christ is mentioned for 15 seconds at the end of the day. Uh, but but the, the messages of positive thinking, the, these things are good, valid messages, and they can be helpful to us in our lives. But in the end, without this new birth and this gift of eternal life, uh, it's, uh, you know, who cares if you prosper for 70 years and have a good success and know that you, you, you failed in the one thing that's really important, you right. did not receive the gift of eternal life. Right. Uh, but... Um, uh, let me see. Oh, I was responding to the Amplified. Something in there I forgot. What was it? Uh, oh, habitually. Yeah. Uh, forming good habits. Forming healthy habits. Good habits. Uh, in replace of bad habits. Yes. Yeah. But but to, to, to form habits, um, it does take some kind of thought process, some kind of a effort, some kind of discipline and determination to... Yeah. to, to um, uh, originate and then develop and improve these these habits that you yeah. really want to have in life. Whether you're trying to set a goal to uh, succeed with your education or your career, or whether you want to succeed in your ministry and your Amen. spiritual growth as a Christian. Um, so there are some things that we can do and we should do to organize ourselves to so we're not just haphazardly blowing in the wind. You know? Right. <laughs> uh, Okay, so let me look at that amplified one last time here. Is there anything else in there? Here's one. Abandoning our old ways. Um, I love it. You can't just choose to abandon your old ways, though. Uh, I, you know, I, one thing about positive thinking and that kind of a, a, a thought process to improve your lives is that um, one of the things, it, techniques that works is that if you have a bad habit, Trying to just discard and get rid of the bad habits sometimes is very difficult. Sure. Particularly if it's an addiction. But if you can replace the bad habit with a good habit, yep. then uh, that that is a very a very helpful in, in getting success. Yeah. So in developing these these good habits, spiritual habits, um, uh, and when it says abandon your old habits, your old ways, you need to replace it with good things. And uh, so, what do you replace it with? Uh, how do we go about, as the Amplified says, um, let me see, how was it stated again? Um, abandoning our old ways is how the Amplified says it. Uh, forming new habits that are good. Well, well, the habit that I think that would be wise for everybody to do is read your Bible. Mm -hmm. The, uh, Jesus said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So um, the word of God here, this could be compared to food, but it's spiritual food. Yeah. How long can you go without food before it, it really affects you? <laughs> well, you know, I fast. We were talking about fasting earlier, and uh, some people want us to join in the fast. I said, well, I fast every day. 
It's true. I fast every single day. But when you fast, you can only do it so long. And at a certain point, you've got to eat or, you know, instead of being good, it becomes bad. But this, you don't want to fast from the Bible. You need to take this in every day as spiritual food. And it'll be good for your spiritual health. The other thing, of course, is if you want to have a relationship with someone, brother, should you ignore them? No, absolutely not. You're not in relationship with them if you ignore them. Yeah. And well, if you really want to develop a close relationship, should you communicate with them? You should. You want to call them or text them or get on private chat sometimes if that's possible, whatever. You just want to stay in that connection. Yeah. Well, that's, that's uh, the word. We have that in the Bible and Christianity is prayer. Prayer is our conversations with God. Amen. And can you imagine if you were, let's say you love someone very much and let's say it's a spouse and uh, you never spoke to each other? I mean, yeah. how, how, how close would you think someone's relationship is if they're not talking? Not very close, I would say. So uh, we read the Bible to learn about God as spiritual food. We talk to God as to build up this uh, relationship and get this close uh, relationship with God. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, what is the one, one purpose of life is to work. Everybody realizes that a per every person is called to do some kind of work in life. We're not all supposed, we're not supposed to just be lazy, do nothings our whole life. And even if you're not talking about religion or Christianity or, the, or spirituality, if that's not even a subject, everybody will agree a person needs to have some kind of work to, for not only to support themselves, but also to give some kind of meaning to their life, some purpose. Well, in Christianity, we're expected to work. We got to get the job, and and uh, but we don't work in Christianity to get our salvation. That's what you the gift, and we don't work to keep our salvation. Uh, no, our our salvation is preserved by God, not persevered by us. God preserves us. He will never leave us or forsake us. Mm, uh, praise God. Uh, uh, the work, though, is something that we should be doing uh, because it will be benefit others and because God has a plan for your life. God has called you to do some kind of ministry. Or if you're a believer and you're not doing any kind of ministry works, then you're really missing out. Because, I mean, for obviously, uh, Jesus said, don't build up your treasures on earth where moths can destroy it. But build up your treasures in heaven for moths and rust and you can't destroy it. No so one's taking those away from you for sure. Everything that's up there is going to be waiting for you. Yeah. So we do get rewards. We get some kind of wages and compensation for the work we do as Christians. But uh, you get none of that unless you first become a Christian. And you do that by simply believing, trusting Jesus, and uh, receiving the gift of eternal life. Amen. Um, so then, so then the other thing, so you've got, if you want to get rid of the bad habits and you want to develop good spiritual habits, we read the Bible, we pray, we have a ministry. And then the last thing I would think of is, is we need a fellowship. Uh, the Bible tells us that we should um, be the light of the world. Don't put your light under a table where no one can see the light. Put it on top of the light of the table so the light can shine and everybody can take advantage and be enlightened. But... Uh, uh, it also says that we should prefer the company of believers. Mm, mm, mm. And so as much as I love my fellow man and I want to serve my fellow man, uh, I should be actually more comfortable, more joyful being around other people who love to talk about Jesus. If you're around people that don't want to talk about Jesus, <laughs> it's a different kind of relationship. It's not, it, you can have friendships. But you can't have fellowship because fellowship center has Jesus has to be the center of the, of the, the fellowship. That's it. Um, so, uh, in other words, hang out, spend a lot of time with other believers, uh, and you will grow. So, these are the things I suggest everybody make an effort. So, when it says that we can make an effort, we we, we do have a part to play, um, but not to get saved. All right. Before I go into any more verses here, any more uh, thoughts on any of that, brother? Uh, no, sir. I think we uh, put it out there pretty well. I'm ready to move on to the next one. Okay, let's go to the KJV for verse 5 uh, and, and 6. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For, I'll read verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Hmm. Hmm. I had a, a, a street preacher friend of mine uh, uh, kind of not rebuked me, but kind of re, um, uh, pointed out an error of my, my thinking. Um, uh, I forgot what I was doing. Uh, worrying or uh, it was not worry. It was something else. But he says a dead man can't worry. <laughs> what <laughs> a dead man can't worry no, okay if, if you've died then you 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 can't you can't worry okay if, if, you know if, have you really died if you die then you don't you, you don't need to worry about being a warrior or uh, uh i'll maybe i'll think of what i was actually doing at the time but he reminded me that hey, hey we are dead we are dead and, and because of that uh we we should be free from uh, all the old things that have been uh, holding us back and, and uh, causing us to uh, to be the new man. Okay, sure. Okay, so uh, five, six, and seven, brother. What are your thoughts on those verses? All right. So on on five, uh, for we've been planted. First of all, I love the word planted. I was talking earlier about being connected to the vine, so that it kind of fits into that a little bit for me, at least. Um, we're planted there. Uh, you know, that that's the act of God putting us there into that place, into the likeness of his death. Um, we should also be the likenesses of his resurre or resurrection. So just like Christ died on the cross, as we were saying earlier, he was resurrected. Therefore, we are also resurrected. So it's that same idea of uh, having been dead, having uh, formerly been a zombie, and our spirit is quickened by the Holy Spirit, so now we're alive. So this is uh, kind of more of the same of just explaining that just as Jesus died on the cross, we're also crucified with him and we're resurrected as he was resurrected with that newness uh, of life and with the salvation that we're given. And then uh, verse six, knowing this, uh, that the old man, okay, again, this is this is the, the, sinful, the sinful man, the part of us that was a zombie that firmly walked around and moaned and looking for brains. That, that's that part of us. Um, but instead of brains, you know, we're looking for worldly things. We're out there trying to get the things of this world when we talk about um, uh, changing our habits. So whatever habits uh, that you did before you were saved, um, and that can be any number of things. Brother Luke talked about addictions, you know, can be lots of different things. Um, could, could be anything really, but they're the things that we look for in that old man, that dead man zombie that walks around. Um, any of those things. And when we're, when we're changed, he gives us new things to look for. He gives us good things. Um, uh, so knowing that we're crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. The whole purpose of Christ coming back was to, to, to die so that we didn't have to, to remove the uh, consequences of sin so that we don't have to do it. He took all of that on himself when he was crucified. All of the sin that's ever been committed by any person, whether they accept his gift or not, all of the sin of the world was on Christ when he died. That is the body of sin, literally the body of sin in the flesh that Christ died. And then uh, so henceforth, that, so that sin might be destroyed. Um, henceforth, we should not serve sin. So if the body is dead, how can, how can a dead man sin? Once, uh, um, whether a person goes into eternity and ends up with God in heaven or whether they go to the other place, um, they're done sinning. And they, you, you wouldn't continue to sin, but that's what we have the ability to do here while we're still on this uh, in this realm. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So that's the point I was just making. So um, you're free from sin at that point. So the, the moment that we accept his free gift, the finished work on the cross, when we accept that gift, we're freed from sin. We're freed from the, the consequences of sin. He paid it all, so we didn't have to. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
uh, let me let me introduce uh, again and again and again. Every time I my, enters my mind, I want to say this, hoping that this will become a slogan repeated by everybody. <clears throat> we are accused of teaching that people have a license to sin, uh, as Paul was accused of. So we're in good company. Uh, if, if you're accused of the same uh, false uh, accusations as Paul, then you know you're doing what Paul did, and you're in good company. Uh, but we do have a license to rest. A license to rest. Mm. You have mm. the right to rest. There are no demands on you. You don't have to follow laws and commandments and, and work real hard, hoping, oh, I hope I've done well enough and they, their judgment, God lets me in. No, mm -hmm. you can rest knowing mm -hmm. that Jesus did it all for you. He did the work of a per living a perfect sinless life. You get credit for that. Yeah. All the sins that we ever did, you don't have to, you can rest. You don't have to suffer the penalty for that. Jesus took the penalty for you. So just rest, mm. rest mm -hmm. in Christ. And um, why can't people rest, Brother Luke? Why can't they rest in that? Why do they want to carry all that stuff around with them when they, they could let it go? Leave it at the foot of the cross. Um, well, I believe that uh, there probably are more than two groups of people in terms of the way they're thinking about this. Some people can't do it because they don't understand it and believe it. They don't understand this doctrine. They either have rejected it or never were taught correctly and never believed correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's unfortunate and hopefully they'll come to know the truth. Uh, and then there, there's um, other people that just, they just reject it and refuse to accept it because of pride See, uh, to me, what do you have to do to believe? Someone asked in the chat room. Because mm -hmm. we said, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, that's mm -hmm. yeah. and then the question that was asked, well, okay, then well, what do you have to do to believe? <laughs> <laughs> you have to listen, yeah. comprehend, mm -hmm. and believe it. If mm -hmm. you either believe it or you don't. If you don't believe it, I can't make you believe it. All we can do is tell you. If you want to reject it and say it's not true, that's fine. If you accept it as true, believing it is true, then you believe. But you, you, what can you do to believe? You can't do anything to believe except listen, and then you either believe it or you don't. Mm. So people, people like us, brother, unfortunately, people who are trying to help other people uh, get salvation, mm -hmm. uh, many people are... Uh, they think that they have to make someone believe. It's yeah. impossible to make someone believe. It's impossible for any person to make themselves believe. All you can do is listen. And if your heart is right, yes, you understand it. You'll jump for joy because you get it. And when you understand this joyful message, you'll be so happy because you'll understand that this applies to you. And, uh, that's, and that means you've believed it. And yeah. if you believed it, you have received it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, it's all the same moment, you know? Yeah. Uh, and the Holy Spirit will give you the assurance of it too. I mean, that, that comes from God. God confirms in our spirit that we are his. Mm -hmm. So it comes from him. You can't force yourself to do anything, but you're certainly not going to get there without looking, without seeking. All we have to do is seek him. He's knocking already. He's he's wanting us to let him in. Uh, yeah. So it's it's not as hard as people make it make it out to be. And the reason why it's hard, in my opinion, is because we make it hard. We 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 add stuff to it. So you mean I have to do this this and this? And God's saying no. All the work's been done, brother. All the work's been done. Yeah. So you don't have to work. I, I remember, you know, sometimes I get it, make a point and I go on a tangent and forget the point what I was actually getting at. But <laughs> you asked why, why they cannot uh, accept this. And it's because of uh, spiritual pride. Mm. Uh, you know, there's this, there's this concept, maybe in America more so than other places, and that is that you get something for nothing. And that, that life is based on a merit system, you know. Uh, you, you can't get something unless you've earned it and deserve it. 
but that's contrary to what the Bible says. The Bible says none of us deserve it. None of us can ever deserve it, no matter how hard we try to be um, uh, deserving. We're not. We never will be. And once that, when a person doesn't understand that, then they'll, they'll reject this. As you said, why would they not believe this and, and receive it with joy? Because yeah. they cannot accept the fact that they are undeserving. And they are absolutely incapable of becoming deserving. And therefore, they need to rely on God to do it for them. And when they do have their heart transformation, where they, their heart is humble, um, I, I don't want to say there's prerequisites to get saved. But I do think that uh, how can a person uh, believe uh, and receive the eternal life gift uh, 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 unless they think that they are incapable of earning it and need to receive it from Jesus. Uh, so it, it, it does take uh, a kind of humility. You know, the, the, uh, you've probably heard the saying that you need to surrender your life to Jesus. Yes. Uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, I believe it is an error to teach people that they need to send, render their life to Jesus in order to get saved. Mm -hmm. But I do think that they need to surrender their efforts and say, I give up. That's All it. my efforts are fruitless. No That's matter it. how hard I try, I cannot make myself acceptable to God. I surrender. I give up. And that is uh, humbling. Unless a person has this humble state of mind, how can they uh, uh, receive the gift? What's the verse, Brother Luke? Um, Come to me, all that are weary and are heaven, heavy laden, and I will give you, give you rest. Yes. That's exactly what that's about. It's, uh, so why do you think someone's weary? Well, they're weary from doing their own work, from, from walking around with all the, all the sin on their back, all their works, everything that they try to do on their own power, they're weary. Heavy laden is all the, all the burdens that we choose to carry around before before meeting him and then some people even after they're after they're saved when we, when we look at them we say well we believe they believe it but they're still still carrying that sack around yeah well, yeah thank you Jesus. thank you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. there it is <laughs> the perfect verse to teach everybody the problem and the solution the problem is that you are striving and working and and you are uh, weary. We get all worn out trying to make ourselves acceptable to God, and it's fruitless and hopeless. And mm -hmm. we're heavy laden with the burdens of, of trying to get rid of our sin. But He will give us rest. Amen. What He wants us to do is give up and say, I can't do it. I'm just going to rest and rely on Jesus. That's it. And that's what it takes, guys. That's what it takes. You, you ask the question. What must we do to be saved? That's what we have to do. We lay our burdens at his feet and say, we can't do it anymore. We lay our works at his feet and say, we can't work our way there. Yeah. And he takes it, and then we can we can be in his rest. Mm -hmm. See, that doesn't seem too hard, does it? All you have to do is lay everything down at Jesus' feet. Yeah. And he's standing there waiting for you. He's got his arms open. He's already stretched his arms out and died for us. And now he's resurrected. We can still see the nails, uh, the nail scars in his hands. We can still see the the uh, wound on his side. But all that's behind him now. It's behind us now. All we have to do is lay them down, our burdens, lay them down at his feet. That's beautiful. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, thank you for giving us that verse. It's and praise really God. That's from beautiful, him. Beautiful thing. Uh, another one like it is uh, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Yes. Uh, people criticize me uh, and say you're teaching easy believism. Well, I am <laughs> easy believism. I believe it's easy because Jesus did the hard part. Yeah, it's, it's all hard. been done. It's hard to live a perfect sinless life, but he did it, and I get credit for it. That's it's right. It's hard to pay, pay for the sins with that suffering and death, but he did it for me. Yeah. So it's easy because he did the hard part and mm -hmm. the burden is light. Yeah. The only thing he's asking you to do is, okay, after I give you eternal life, 
come on, there are things that you should be doing uh, to, to be part of this uh, church and to uh, tell other people the good news and, and to grow spiritually into a mature child of God. And, and so these are not unreasonable. You know, he says, this is our reasonable service. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, brother, get a load of this, the, um, these verses in the Amplified. Listen to this. Yes, sir. For if we have become one with him, permanently united in the likeness of his death, we will also certainly be one with him and share fully in the likeness of his resurrection. Mm. We know that our old self, that is our human nature without the Holy Spirit, was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Mm. But the person who has died with Christ has been freed from the power of sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unbelievable. Believable, though. <laughs> Ab absolute clarity. A person should have no confusion if they, uh, if they listen carefully to, to, to that. Uh, yeah, we're nailed to the cross. That's a good. That's a good image. We're nailed to the cross with Christ. Mm -hmm. He took all the pain of it, but you know, uh, metaphorically speaking, that's that's the image we should get. So if we can, if we can accept that first image in our noggin, you know, of us being nailed to the cross with Christ, then we should also be able to accept the next image, which is Him being raised from the dead mm -hmm. and standing there um, with a different countenance. We have a different countenance as well. The The spirit in us is quickened, and we're, we're no longer a zombie. We're alive. And uh, yes, you can see that in other people. You can see a uh, different countenance with someone that you knew before that's been saved. Um, how many times, Brother Luke, have you uh, been around someone that was, was not saved before, and they come to you and say, Brother, I'm. Uh, you can now call me a brother or a sister. I'm saved now, and you can look at their face. You can see the difference in them. Is that something you've experienced? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I remember I had a, a party. I used to have a big house with a giant pool, and 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 we have a lot of people over for these big parties. And I had a friend come over that I hadn't seen for a long time, and we caught up, and he. Uh, he, he uh, was having a hard time with all the changes in me because he knew that I was street preaching right? and couldn't get over this. He says, how is it possible that, it, uh, that y you, the way I've known you through high school and college of things mm -hmm. we did together, we should be dead or in prison. Right. And, and now you're out there standing on the street with a sign and a bullhorn preaching about yeah. Jesus. I mean, this doesn't, and, one of my street preaching friends was with me at that party and he's listening and he said to my friend Rick, he said, he said, Hey, it doesn't seem natural, does it? Huh. And the guy didn't get it at first. So Bible Jim was the guy. He said, Bible Jim said, Hey, hey, listen, it doesn't it doesn't seem natural, does it? <laughs> and I'm looking at Jim smiling because <laughs> I know the point making. I so finally said to my friend, I said, It's not natural, Rick. Right. It's supernatural. There it is. My desires and my interests, my activities, they're absolutely 180 degrees different than when you knew me mm. because a supernatural changes have taken place. Not natural, not normal for someone to be like this and then be like that. Something supernatural has happened. That's right. The Spirit of God's transforming me. Yeah, he transforms, not us. We don't transform. He transforms us. Yeah. By the daily need, renewing of our mind. Don't fight against the spirit. Amen. Rest. And if you do the, the, the exercises I told you about, study your Bible, have fellowship with other believers, get busy doing some print ministry works, and, and pray every day. Uh, if you do those things, and it's just like if a person gets good nutrition, they do good exercise, they go yeah. to school, good education, and then they get busy working hard in their career. Guess what? That person becomes very successful. Yeah. And it's the same thing. These are these are uh, just 
uh, apply those same things to our spiritual life. Amen. Um, Good stuff tonight. Yeah, let me let me read this again in the Amplified but more slowly. He says, for if we have become one with him, permanently united in the likeness of his death, become one with him. And the Bible does say that we are one with Christ. Christ yeah. is in us. We are in Christ. Yeah. And uh, that's what it, um, when I was saying we believe into Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, in the likeness of his death, we will also certainly be one with him and share fully in the likeness of his resurrection. Mm. Of course, the likeness of his resurrection, that's a wonderful topic. Uh, obviously, many, many hours of study could be done just on the resurrection. I did a, I have a, probably a 20 hour playlist that I did uh, on the resurrection, but it, it's, 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 a, it's called the um, uh, More Than a Carpenter by John. Oh. It's a paperback book. Yep that uh, the group of us, we read through that book carefully and, and discussed it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, on 90% of the book is all about the resurrection, the proof of it, and the, yeah. the, the effect of it. And um, so if you want to know about the resurrection, you go to that, that study there. But this resurrection is a wonderful study and subject and, and promise because J Jesus is the prototype in the uh -huh. resurrection. And we are going to be raised to life in the, in the way that he was with this glorified Amen. body. And, uh, you know, we speculate as what this glorified body will be like and capable of. We know we're not going to ever have death or pain or sorrow or crying anymore. Yeah. But also, we're going to have some kind of superpowers. We, I think perhaps we'll be able to appear in a room without going through a door, as Jesus did. Yeah. Maybe we'll be even able to transport ourselves from place to place, uh, like teleportation. Absolutely. Uh, maybe we will even be able to change our actual physical um, uh, sh shapes and, uh, and uh, appearance. It seemed like Jesus, Jesus perhaps did that when people didn't recognize him. They're yeah. talking, they don't recognize him, and then suddenly their eyes were opened. Now, was it they just were confused and God didn't let them see who he was? Or did, did Jesus actually change his appearance and then at a certain point... He, he let them see who he really was. Yeah. I don't know, but these are things that are, uh, I'm excited about. Yep. My, my, my nephew is only six, but he wants to be as as quick as, fa uh, as Flash and as strong as the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> he knows about heaven. I was talking to him. He said, do we get, he was asking me this question. I said, he said, Could, do, will, will we have superpowers in heaven? I said, yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly what they'll be. And he, without blinking, he looked at me and said, I want to be as fast as Flash and as strong as the Hulk. And I just laughed and I said, buddy, I, there's a possibility that God would let you let you do that. You know, We don't know exactly what it's going to be, but I do believe that um, Adam and Eve, this is a whole other subject, but I'll just touch on it briefly. Adam and Eve were way closer to that than we are. I mean, sin has ravaged this world for, for the thousands of years. And when remember, they were connected to God. They walked with God. They they experienced um, a similar relationship that we'll have with Him in heaven. And, and until they sinned, they they were uh, they they were invincible. They, nothing could hurt them. Um, they probably could walk uh, further and run, and who knows what all they could do. But we know for sure that they walked with God, like we're going to walk with God. Yes. And then sin sin entered in, sin entered in. And over time, it ravaged this earth and it ravaged the people that were born later so that the life expectancy now is, what, you know, 75, 80 years, depending on whether whether you're a man or a woman, you know, generally. Um, back then, you see the, the, the length of time that people lived back with Methuselah, almost a thousand years he lived. And then over time, just less and less and less and less. The ravages of sin have done their work in this world. But fortunately, what we're talking about here is that if you are able to accept his free gift, your spirit will never die. And then if, and then in the end, we'll get our eternal bodies. And I do think that it, it comes with some kind of superpowers. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that makes me think more about the uh, uh, our eternal state of existence and not only the glorified bodies, but what will eternity be like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I found it very, very curious why almost never do you ever hear sermons about 
heaven, about living in the new heavens and new earth and you know, what it's going to be like. Uh, it, it's almost never taught. And if it is taught at all, it's taught for like 30 minutes and that's it. Yeah, it's they're afraid. Teaching on it. It's probably the most neglected subject that's taught in the church. Well, probably about five years ago, uh, I decided that we would do a study on heaven. Most of the playlists that I've done, this is that if I teach on something and it requires a series of videos, maybe we'll have a group discussion like this for two hours long. Yeah. But two hours isn't enough, so maybe we have to do five or ten sessions. So right. maybe there's five or ten or twenty hours on a subject. I said the one on the resurrection was probably twenty hours. Mm -hmm. But longest series that I ever did teaching on was on heaven. And uh, if anybody here now is struggling with being excited, if, if you're if you're depressed, and if you need like a reason to live and to be excited about your future and the promises of God, go to my playlist titled 50 Hours in Heaven. Nice. I, it's, it's not titled 50 Hours because I'm claiming I had some out-of-body experience and went to heaven for 50 hours. Thank God. It's 50 hours in heaven because the, the whole series takes 50 hours for us to <laughs> 50 hours of content. Yeah. And we used a book titled Heaven by Randy Alcorn as the yes. for the for the study. But yep. I tell you, when I did that study, it probably was perhaps the happiest period of my life. I believe it. When you're focused on heaven and, and your future. Mm -hmm. uh, like that and your your mind is on it like Paul said whatever's good and pure and lovely and a good report think mm -hmm. on these things Amen. better than thinking about the promise of eternal life in heaven and what that's going to be like it for eternity yes so anybody listening now is struggling at all with any kind of depression or anxiety or something watch that playlist that will definitely cheer you up yeah, and also I'll just add to that for uh, uh, the book that he referenced, Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Um, I I tell everyone they should read that, regardless of whether you're depressed or not. You should you should definitely read that. He uses the Bible to present a common sense idea, extrapolating the way that we live in this world. This world being a shadow of the real thing. Right now we see uh, through a glass darkly. We we have a partial understanding of the way God means for it to be. So if we can agree and believe that this world is the shadow, then we have to agree and believe that this next world, when uh, when everything is made new, that it will be the real thing. And that all of these things that, that we experience here, some of the things will be similar, but it, they'll be even more vibrant and brighter and more wonderful and more amazing. And that um, there, there are going to be similarities to this world. This world is a shadow, and the next world is uh, even better. Um, and get a chance. If you get a chance, uh, definitely check that book out and read it. It is very, very biblically based. It is a great study. And watch the videos, too. I'm glad you told me about that because I'll, I'll have to take my time with it. But I'll go back and watch those, two. <laughs> 50 hours in heaven. All right. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, not only a wonderful, uh, very happy subject to immer be immersed in. Amen. But, uh, uh, it's heartbreaking to me that it's so neglected. I'm asking anybody watching now, how much study have any of us done on heaven? How many times have you been to church and they teach you about heaven? Uh, but there are, I want to do all these sermons about hell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's that's a great point because people want to focus on the negative aspect of so they can try to scare people into their congregation. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more exciting to talk about, hey, you, if you're feeling stressed out in this world, you're feeling overworked, you're feeling sick and tired, let's, the, let's focus on and think about this the next world. We have to get through this period of time, but when this is over, there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more tiredness, there'll be no more... Um, uh, no more sickness. All of those things will, will won't even be an issue anymore. The Bible says that event that we will get to a point where, where we no longer remember the the things of this world. Can you imagine how wonderful heaven would be for you to be able to forget about what you've gone through here? It has to be amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you ever just 
really want to be excited about your future. Mm. Wow. Uh, all right. Let me. I'm excited now. That's awesome. <laughs> let me get back to this text. It says uh, about the resurrection. Uh, and then verse six says, we know that our old self, that is our human nature without the Holy Spirit, was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the person who has died with Christ has been freed from the power of sin. So, you know, this portion of scripture here and the, and the one we're coming to is, is really Paul's answer to this first question here in the beginning of the chapter. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So, um, it's um, if you if you study church history, uh, and not only is church history, but just just look at the epistles and the book of Acts, and you'll you'll see that even in the scriptures themselves, there's a record of the accusations against Paul, mm -hmm. and, and there's there's even let's say two extreme factions about Paul today that I've encountered. Right. One are those people who elevate Paul above all else, even above Christ, I'm sorry to say, because they say you cannot be saved from the red letters. The, in the Bible, the actual words that Jesus spoke in many Bibles are printed in red ink to stand out. So you see, that's what Jesus himself spoke. And, and so there are people that say, no, you, you can't get saved by Jesus' words. You can't get saved by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you can't get saved except for Paul's writing. Romans through Philemon. They don't even account tribute to Jesus for Paul. Right. But only Paul's letters. Paul is our apostle. He's the one that had the gospel. None of them, they all had a different gospel to, for the Jews. It's a different message for the Jews. And that false teaching is um, uh, it's called hyper dispensationalism i call it paul onlyism but hyper means you you've gone too far with something you've hyper you've overdone it and so they've elevated paul even above jesus above all the other apostles and that's an extreme now i very I extreme paul. in one way i elevate paul saying that look peter and john and, and, and jesus and they all said you can find all of them saying you're saved by believing in jesus mm -hmm. but paul says yeah, you're saved by believing in Jesus, and I want you to know that if you add anything to it, then you've ruined it. You're Amen. not saved unless it's Jesus only. Amen. Uh, so that's Paul's contribution, and that's the Paul's the the di distinction we, we, that we should recognize in Paul. And then that way, Paul is special. But now, so that's the correct way of understanding Paul and how he fits into the church and history. But then you have another group of people that they reject Paul as a false teacher and they, they say, you don't ignore all of Paul's writings. And historically there are some theologians that, that took that approach too. And they didn't even recognize the, the Pauline epistles as, as a canon. So, and, and today, if you look on YouTube, you'll find some people teaching the same thing that Paul is a false apostle, just like the accusations. Why is it he's defending himself in, in this Romans in all these epistles, he's defending himself over and over again because He's being accused of being a false apostle. So yeah. they accused him from the beginning. They've accused him through church history. They're accusing him today. And the truth is, no, he was. His, he is probably the most significant apostle because of what I mentioned. Yeah. But he uh, is not to be worshipped and elevated in, in, uh, in the way that the Paul only is does. Uh, but he should also be believed and accepted for his, his unique mm -hmm. his, um uh, really um, uh, necessary, absolutely necessary contribution to the church that don't add anything to the cross or you've run it. Amen. Um, I've had hyper, dispension, uh, hyper dispensationalists actually say to me that you can't get saved from anything in the Bible except for uh, Paul's uh, letters. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I When I came on YouTube 10 years ago, so, uh, probably had about 20 of my closest friends in the beginning who were hyper dispensationalists 
and uh, they they teach the gospel and they teach no works and uh, so we hit it off but over a period of about a year uh, i noticed that every time i quoted the gospel of john and uh, about and using it uh, in a gospel message i was rebuked and corrected and they said you can't use john you have to, only paul's letters and uh uh, John, the, John and uh, the, the Gospels, those are to the Jews. That's not us. Uh, and I finally, I had enough of it. And I had that the first time I stood up and I, I said, I'm, I'm not going to put up with it. Good. And, um, ever since then, I've been uh, trying to make sure everybody understand the problem with hyperdispensationalism. That's a huge problem because it, it twists it. it. It twists the truth of Scripture. Listen, you can get saved by the Old Testament as well. The, the Jesus is is preached in the Old Testament everywhere. You can't almost, you can't go to one book in in the Old Testament and not see the shadow of Christ that's to come. It's unbelievable what they try to how they twist scripture and try to make it into something that it's not. YouTube has a question that's actually pretty good for this particular part of the discussion. He says, "How about getting saved with no Bible, brother Luke?" Well, you, you 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 don't have to have the Bible in writing. Yep. But you have to have the Bible verbally at least. You have to have the message. The message. Whether, whether whether I don't have a Bible, but I just tell you what the Bible says, then you don't have to have the Bible. But the message in the Bible about salvation, you have to have it. Otherwise, you might as well become a, a Roman Catholic, and because they don't use the Bible, they use men the traditions of men the traditions of popes Amen. So without the bible uh then uh you had just have a mangled mess of whatever a lot of uh, famous theologians have taught yeah uh, but the bible is a litmus test to tell us this is the truth whatever a pope says whatever a theologian says let's see if the bible agrees or not so we need the bible for that purpose but if someone is telling you what's in the bible but neither of you own a bible as long as you're getting the truth of what the bible says that it's it's a free gift and it's it comes with a guarantee then then uh, you're uh you don't have to have the written bible yeah i hope that's helpful i think i think it was helpful i think that's exactly what we're getting at we're just uh trying to make sure that people understand that uh god's god can save a person in any way he wants to now he's given us his word so that uh, we have his love letter uh, to us in preparation for Christ's coming in the first place. So the proverbial um, uh, uh, native on the island that uh, doesn't know how to read an uh, English Bible in the first place, and he meets a missionary, the missionary talks to him, and he doesn't have his Bible with him either. He gives him the message, somehow translates the message to him. And I promise you this, you know, uh, his word says that he won't leave any of his children. He'll, he'll, he'll come and get all of us that are his. All, all that were given to Christ by God will be his. So um, the spirit will do whatever he has to do to make sure and save all of, uh, of God's children. Every single one of them, regardless of their situation. And, um, the, I mean, obviously, we have the Bible, so why not use it? Why not use his his love letter to us? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some good comments. Thank you, uh, chat room. You got a capital You got a capital letter response there. Yeah, but YouTube censorship says if, if he can use donkey and rocks. Yeah. Jesus says that if you didn't have uh, the, the prophets, the, the rocks would cry out the gospel message. Yeah, we know that a donkey does. So, uh, yep. Yeah, God will find a way to to uh, get what we need to know to everybody. Amen. Uh, Thanks it, for the confirmation. Yeah. So, uh, uh, VD uh, says you just answered the question I was about to ask. Can't God save any way He wants? Yes, yeah, He does. Uh, we answered it, I guess. But yeah. Um, now, um, obviously, the Bible has become very, very important throughout all of history because until we had the printing press, 
and the publishing of Bibles and the accessibility of Bibles to the whole world, uh, people were very, very limited. And, and, and now on top of it, we even have the Bible just by clicking your mouse and you have all these different Bibles uh, through these uh, apps. Uh, so it's never been easier. Um, and, yeah, God will find a way. Amen. He always will find a way. He will not lose one of his. Yeah. Not one. Not one. He'll, he comes for all of his sheep, every single one. He left the 99 to go get the one. That's very, very clear. He'll leave the 99 to get the one that's lost. He will always come after you, always. Okay, let's go uh, verse 8 and 9 in the KJV says, Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, mm. knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Mm -mm -mm. Hey, brother. Yeah, so it goes back to the idea that he 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 said to us, what's the what's the last thing he said to us before he ascended back into heaven? He he said, I go to prepare a place for you so that you may where I go, you may be there with me also. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. So he went to go prepare a place for us so that we may follow him. Eventually, we will be with him forever. So the way that we do that, are, it, it, we're dead with Christ. We have to. It's the same thing we've been talking about, that um, baptism from death into life. So when we do that, when we accept his free gift, we know that we will live with him again. At the end of this life, whenever we breathe our last or if Christ returns, if we if we're uh, blessed enough to live that long and we don't have to taste death and we see Christ uh, coming back for us, uh, then we'll be changed in an instant. We'll be uh, our, our body will be quickened to match our spirit. We'll have that eternal body and we will ascend to be with him forever. So uh, verse nine, knowing uh, that Christ being raised from the dead, he dieth no more. He's not dying again. People try to keep crucifying him. When you carry that stuff around with you, you don't leave it at his feet. You're carrying that stuff as if you uh, you can do something with it. That you're, <laughs> that, that you're going to do something with your works. You're going to do something that's going to make up for the lack that, that we have uh, added to what Christ did. We add anything to what Christ did, it, it amounts to nothing. If we don't add anything, if we just rest in his finished work, then that's everything. It's like standing before God and he says, uh, you know, he questions you and says, you know, what what right do you have to be here? And we hold up a little card that we get from Christ that says that has his blood on it. And we say it's only by his blood, not anything that I do. Our righteousness is his filthy rags. We, we count on his righteousness. Um, death hath no more dominion over him. Um, death can't touch Christ anymore. He died once for all, and so that we don't have to die. We die in the flesh, yeah, our flesh dies, it, it, you know, if we're not alive when he comes. You know, our flesh dies, and that's the end of it. We'll be alive with him forevermore. I love, I love that verse, dieth no more, no more death. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died un, uh, unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. It's a beautiful picture. Uh, yeah, it's it sounds familiar to me. Uh, the verse in uh, Hebrews when it says you crucified Christ afresh. I think it's how it's stated. And um, to me, I believe that Paul did write Hebrews. Uh, I don't know how it breaks down in terms of majority opinion as far as. Uh, who, how many people think Paul wrote it versus how many people think Apollos wrote it or somebody else. But I know a lot of people do agree with me that Paul wrote it. And I, I think he wrote it for a lot of reasons. Um, one is the, um, the skill. Um, and in, in, in Galatians, well, in, in Romans, we're seeing it, but, but particularly in Galatians and in Romans and in um, Hebrews, we see Paul systematically building up an is inescapable wall so that you there's no escape from a, a conclusion. Right. Much like a, an attorney would do a building his case in a courtroom so that the verdict comes out the right way. Good point. And, 
uh, and so he is so systematic and so skillful at, at presenting the case, uh, one brick upon another and another. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's we see that also in Hebrews. But uh, this line in Hebrews where they crucify Christ afresh. Uh, in other words, if you put, uh, if you are going back to the animal sacrifices of yes. Jesus, and, and that means that you either don't understand or do not believe the fact mm. that Christ died once for all and animal sacrifices no longer have a role at all. Mm. There it is. And if you do decide to continue doing animal, animal sacrifices, you crucify Christ afresh. It's, it's the greatest insult there is. And, and whether you're adding an annual sacrifice or you're adding a water communion Yep. or uh, ecstatic utterances or uh, uh, whatever whatever it is or uh, change life or prophesying uh, any, yeah. anything that you say must accompany your faith yep. uh, then you're saying what Christ did on the cross is not enough and there's no greater insult and you might as well be spitting in the face of Jesus on the cross saying that was not enough yep Yep. I do my part now. You started it, but I got to finish it. Amen. So um, that is, to me, uh, what we're the point is being made in in Hebrews, and when it says here, uh, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. In other words, mm. can't be crucified all over again every time mm. you think that, like a Roman Catholic. They they exemplify this in two ways that I can think of. Okay. One is with the uh, what they call the mass. Dr. Ruckman says mass is an abbreviation for massacre. Mm. So every time, every time they have the Roman Catholic service, it's called a mass. And, and mm. Dr. Ruckman says they are massacring Jesus on the cross all over again by Amen. saying, "Here's his body. His body has to be broken. He has to die every single time." Yes. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is they do is require the the confessional booth and so you mm -hmm. have to now jesus obviously wasn't enough to pay for all your sins you've got to keep on confessing it and getting forgiveness from the priest so yeah. in those ways they're uh, crucifying christ again and again and again yeah and, uh, hebrew says you can't do that and here in romans paul saying jesus can't die he, he says uh death hath no more dominion over him he says being raised from the from the dead dieth no more yes yes now jesus doesn't have to die again and again for you he died once that's sufficient mm -hmm. the sacrifice was enough to pay for not only your sins before you believed but every sin after you believed until your last breath amen then add my sins to it and brother Cripp's sins and never the sins of the whole world not only people living now but throughout all the history of the world even since adam and eve before judaism was started every person who's ever lived all those sins were put on jesus his one time death was enough there was propitiation payment in full so yes payment for everybody's sins amen I had to have a word picture really quick. So if, if you can imagine for one, just bear with me, you can imagine for one second that, that Jesus is standing with you right now. He's standing right there. You can see him. He can see you. And you say to him, what you did on the cross is not enough. Get back up there. Sure. Get back up there on the cross because I, you know, I need to add this and this and this, and this is what I've done. I've cast out demons. I've done this. I've, I've given to the sick. I've, I've uh, touched people and healed them and blah, blah, blah. And it's not enough. Get back up there on the cross. That's what they're saying, in essence. They want Christ to get back up on the cross. He already took care of it. It's finished. The reason why it's finished work is because it's finished work. He said it is finished. I'm going to trust what Jesus said rather than anything that I say. What I have is righteous. My righteousness is, is as filthy rags. So we know that his righteousness is pure. It washes away a multitude of sins. So I'm going to choose to rest in his finished work rather than on anyone else, anything that anyone else tells me, or my own filthy righteousness. 
I'll take what he did any day. I don't want him to get back up on the cross. He already did it. It's done. It's finished. It's over. Rest in him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, you have a license to rest. We all have a license to rest. Amen. Have you done a video about that with that title yet? Yes. Yes, I Okay, did. I'll go back and watch that. License to rest. I love it. I think it's about a two-minute video. Um, oh, it needs to be longer. And, and it's a... Uh, <laughs> It's a uh, basically. I wanted to acknowledge Brother Ron, Brother Ronnie, known as Hood Minister Saint Hood, and uh, he's the one that I heard state state it that way. And ever since then, I've been repeating it, promoting it, and and I want him to be recognized for seeing it that way. Uh, but yeah, if if we would, um, if people would embrace these three things, I, I would be nothing would make me happier in my life. Mm -hmm. that, that's the term. Free gift theology. Gift. Let's emphasize gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. That's gift. what people need to understand. And and then it's guaranteed. It, the gift comes with a guarantee. Guar eternal life is guaranteed. And that's what a person needs to understand and believe in order to receive it. You need to under believe that it's a free gift from Jesus. You don't earn it through your religious efforts. And it's guaranteed that you, you're going to heaven. You have eternal life. Guaranteed. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. No matter what, he is faithful. He remains faithful. Amen. He remains faithful. Yes. He cannot deny himself. Okay. Uh, then, um, and then uh, the other one, uh, the other slogan, of course, is we have a license to rest. And that's really what we really want to raise. And just look, the good news is that, uh, hey, you're, you're uh, what is it, heavy... But how did you, what was that verse again? Something worry and heavy laden? How was that? Yeah. Um, come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy weary. laden, yeah. and I will give you rest. Yes. You don't need to be weary, wearing yourself out, laboring, trying to work your way up, climb this ladder up to heaven, straining yourself. Well, no. It's, Praise God. You don't need to be weary. You, mm -hmm. you know, just rest in Jesus. Amen. And, and, and uh, uh what, heavy laden. Yeah, get rid of this this burden, this this worry you have in your mind. Am I have I done enough? Am I been good enough? Have I followed the commandments enough? You know, uh, no, forget about that. Don't worry about anything. Just believe the guarantee that you're promised eternal life. Mm, mm, and, mm. And, and if you believe you, you're guaranteed eternal life, then that's when you get you get it. It's guaranteed. Yep. Guaranteed, my guaranteed friend. For to get the guarantee. Listen, there's no guarantee on this earth that, that means the same as this guarantee. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm, uh, praise God. Uh, we're getting close to time. Maybe we have time for a couple more verses here. Let's yes, sir. Let's knock it out. Okay. Uh, verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. Once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Mm, yep. He died once. This one's pretty simple. We can move through this pretty fast, hopefully. He died once, died unto sin once. That's all he needed. For one man's sin, he entered into the world, and for all, one man died, which was Christ. You get that? So Adam sinned. Out of one man's sin, all were declared sinful. And on one man who was righteous, which is Christ, he died for all men, so no one else would have to die. He died once, doesn't die again, doesn't die a second time or third time, fourth time, whatever. Uh, no matter how many times people try to get him to get on, to get back up on the cross, he, it's not necessary. He died once. And that he lives, he lives unto God. We live unto God. We're reconciled with God through Christ, through, through Christ's finished work. That's what the whole Bible is about. It's about how much he loved us that when sin entered in, he already had a plan before the foundations of the earth of what he was going to do. And he sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but through the world, uh, through him, the world might be saved. Bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, if you really want to understand um, Paul's letters, uh, you, you need to always keep in mind and ask yourself, why does he say such a thing? 
why does he ask so many questions? Why does he bring up a subject? Uh, well, he brings it up because it's an issue at the time that he's trying to address. Mm, still an issue. Yeah. And the issue here, he, why does he keep on emphasizing he died once? Why? Why is that? Why, is, why even bother mentioning such a thing? It's because they're challenging, that he's being challenged saying, no, uh, it's not enough. You got to right. all get circumcised. Yeah, there you go. No, and Paul just no. He died once. You're crucifying him all over again, but saying saying that he, he needs to die again because he he didn't do enough. Yeah, got to keep the dietary laws. You know, we got to go back and keep all the dietary laws. We got to go back to the sacrifice. No, he died once. We don't have to do any of that. Yeah. Rest in Jesus. What a great comment. Yes, that's the point. Rest in Jesus, Evie. Yeah. Um, let me read 10, uh, for in that he died, he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Uh, okay. Let's see how the Amplified states that last part. Well, uh, the whole thing for the death that he died, he died to sin, ending its power and paying the sinner's debt once and for all. Once and for all. And the life that he lives he lives to glorify God in unbroken fellowship with him. Unbroken fellowship. He liveth unto God is how it is in the KJV. Yeah. Mm. And in verse 11, uh, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, uh -huh. but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm. Brother? There's the contrast again, yeah. death and life. Okay, so we talked about earlier, um, we were trying to describe what the baptism is, and we, we, we talked about it being that we're born dead, we're born zombies, going around seeking after the things of the world, and then uh, we believe in Christ's finished work, our spirit is quickened, we become alive again. So there's the contrast. This is what we see every week when Paul does these contrasts. So again, it's the same words. Uh, dead is the first part. And then life is the second part. Being alive is the second part. And how do we get that? How do we go from being dead to being alive? What's the only way that, that we have to accomplish that? He, he accomplished that in us is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how it happens. That's the quickening that happens through, through his spirit. And again, it's his finished work. Um, all we have to do is rest in him. Lay our, all our burdens at his feet. He's already done the work. We don't, we don't get there by our own works. We're, we start out dead, and then once we accept his free gift, then we're made alive through Christ. Yeah. Uh, I have a video titled, uh, Let's Stay Focused on Jesus. Mm, please. Um, it, it is mind-boggling to me how, how and, and why so many professing Christians always want to talk about sin and always want to especially examine other people's lives and their sins. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, first of all, um, we, 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 we need to be thinking about Jesus and then sin won't even be an issue. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we're focused on Jesus, mm -hmm. The last thing on my mind is plotting and scheming how I'm going to go about doing some kind of a suit. I'm too busy thinking about Jesus. Didn't you say that? Like, didn't you say that last week that we're talking about when we do these broadcasts? We're not thinking about sin. We're focused on his word and focused on fellowship. Mm -hmm. So when the, this two-hour period of time, um, we're not focused on sin. We're focused on Jesus. We're focused on the words of his, of his word. Yeah, and that's uh, that's a good that's a good point. For two hours, everybody here uh, in the chat room, we're all we're all thinking about Jesus and the scriptures and stuff. And the last thing we're doing is, uh, uh, I hope nobody has, has said, "Oh, they said, give me a break. I'm gonna go do some sinning, and I'll be back in a few minutes." No, that's, that's right. They're not. You're not thinking about it. Sin doesn't even enter our mind when we're focused on Jesus. So we have a license not to sin. No. 
We have a license to rest. When we rest in Jesus, we're not going to be exercising the freedom to sin. We're not even thinking about it. And also, as we focus on Jesus, the Holy Spirit is free now to transform our thoughts and desires, and mm -hmm. therefore, following our, our, our would it be our behavior would be changing. Amen. The daily renewing of our minds. His mercies come new every morning. And all we have to do is ask him. He will renew our mind every day. Every day we can walk in the newness of life, and it's a choice. We decide to walk in that newness, and the Holy Spirit makes it possible through him. Yeah. Then verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, mm. that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Don't go back to being a zombie, guys. That's it. You you don't go back to the old man. You don't go back to the, the mortal body that's been destroyed. That mortal body that we still have to walk around in it until we're changed or until we uh, until we die. So don't let that sin that used to be a part of your life. Again, it's the idea of the zombie walking around seeking on the things of the world. Well, we don't have to seek after those things anymore. When that quickening happens and we're changed, uh, we don't have to obey the lust of the flesh. We don't have to obey the, the, the zombie, what the zombie craves for. The new spirit in us craves the good things that Brother Luke mentioned earlier, things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are of good report. These are the things that we're told to think of. Uh, yeah, the uh, so here here is a statement by Paul, and in an in, in, in instruction in a way, or at least let's say a uh, an order. He's ordering. He says, "Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, mm. that ye should obey it in the lust thereof." Uh, so he's telling us, "Do that. Do this." Now, how are you supposed to accomplish that? If if you think you're going to accomplish that by uh, focusing on the old commandments and, and then the sins and then saying I got to get this sin on my life, I get that. No, what you're doing is you're focusing on sin. You got sin on your mind, so therefore uh, the temptations are on your mind, and therefore you can uh, you you have this struggle. Yeah, but you don't even have the temptations. You don't have the struggle if you are focusing on Jesus. That's how you do this. That's how you accomplish what he's saying here. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. How's a person mm -hmm. supposed to accomplish that? By staying focused on Jesus. Amen. I want to add, uh, Natalie Ann just put a good comment in there. It fits in. So um, she says, when I blow it, I get back up. Now I understand instead of wallowing in my BS, it is so much easier to turn from specific sins when you realize God doesn't hate you. Of course, he doesn't hate you. He loves you. And he already did all the work. All we have to do is rest in him. That's it. Yeah. Uh, okay, brother. I, uh, I like to try to have no about two hours. Go start at 11 p.m. Eastern time. Yes, so sir. We're getting we're right at that time. Yes, so sir. Let's take a few minutes to sum up our thoughts. But first, let me just ask in, in the chat room uh, before we're finished, if you have a question that you want to ask us or some uh, statement that you'd like us to respond to, Go ahead and post it there in all caps before we, we're finished, and we'll try to uh, address that. Otherwise, I'll assume that uh, you know uh, you don't uh, you don't need any further elaboration on any of these points. Uh, okay, uh, brother, uh, why don't you sum up your thoughts about the the talk today? Yeah, my first of all, my thought was what a great study this was today. I'm just I I feel alive and I feel uh, lighter than I did when I came in, and that any study that we do that uh, where you can actually feel the Holy Spirit working through the chat room and through what's being said, um, to me that's that's a great uh, that's a great study. Um, I, I I feel that oftentimes in this particular study, but tonight for some reason it just it seemed like to me, at least in my spirit, it just felt like. Um, Everything just clicked, and uh, I love the points that were made uh, by both of us and also the chat room being involved, as usual. And just a lot of love in the chat room, too, for each other, just everyone just uh, reaching out, and it's just a great thing. Um, so in as far as the text, text is concerned, each week we see how uh, Paul, every time he keeps hitting the same points again and again. And as we talked about, the reason he's doing that is because he was being attacked at that time 
by the false teachers. He was being accused of being a false teacher. And the reason why this is pertinent today is because we're dealing with the same problems today. We're dealing with people that that accuse us of uh, greasy grace or easy believism and and you know license to sin and all that stuff, which is could not be further from the truth. We don't want to live in that. We want to walk in the newness of life. And this, this is a this is a great study and and some great verses to think about for the rest of the week. And uh, that's it for me. Just want to uh, say good night to everyone in the chat room and thank you for letting me be here. And I look forward to next week. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um yeah, the chat room. Uh, yeah, I, I can't ever say this uh, often enough how much um, we appreciate you in the chat room, your participation. And uh, I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. I remember more than a year ago when we started doing these with the chat rooms. I, I've done this for probably five or six years, but yeah. the chat room thing is relatively new compared right. to the overall hangout concept. And when the chat room started, I noticed that, that people would disagree in there and they turn on each other. And, yeah. uh, and um, the environment that we have in our chat room, which I'll just, let me just call our fellowship room. Yes. It, it, it is um, such an example of Christian fellowship and, and grace and charity that uh, I know that if the viewing audience goes through this later and just skims through and looks at all the, the comments in the chat room, they're going to see an example of, of what Christ really wants us to be as a, as a body you know, of believers. Mm. Uh, the kind of attitude towards each other, the grace and charity uh, uh, for each other, even as we disagree. Amen. Out of their way to disagree at kindest most polite way possible yeah. and, uh, that is uh, it's a beautiful thing to see and it, it's a great example for the for not only the the, the secular world if they look, take a look at this yeah. but much of what we see in uh, from professing christians is sickening to me i made a video oh. titled why most christians make me sick do you think yeah. I, I like to make a video titled why most christians make me sick no no Mm. But, but I have, I feel I have to address some of the horrible behavior that I see from professing Christians yep. that want to attack and stir up trouble and be hateful yep. and divisive and, and stuff. And, and then people can see what we're accomplishing here as a fellowship uh, is, 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 I think it's, it's a model. It's Matthias, uh, he and I were talking about this church of the eternal security concept and what we've been trying to do for the last year. And uh, when I when it first started, uh, and for the longest time, I said privately that it's it's an experiment that can't last; it cannot succeed right. because my experience was so negative throughout this YouTube history that uh, I thought it doomed to failure. It, at some point, it's going to all fall apart, come crumbling down. There's going to be divisions and fighting, and and because that's what I've witnessed. Yes. But now Matthias and I both have come to the conclusion that not only is this experiment a success, mm -hmm. but now we can actually call it a blueprint. Mm -hmm. This is a model, I believe, for others. I hope other channels will adopt this kind of thing. Unity, yeah. liberty, charity, and really and make sure that everybody does get that liberty and yep. charity. Yeah. Uh, so... Thank you. Well, it's affected me. It's I uh, just want me let me add this one thing. It's affected me. So, I I've, I've been involved with Matthias for uh, about a year now and started with him, but then I I ran into you and and um I heard you guys keep talking about this and uh, I even texted you at one point because I wanted to use that um in a conversation I was having. And uh you were gracious enough to 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 give me those three tenants that I was asking for. And um, I, I I use it all the time now, and it's wonderful. And it's just it's just another way to make um, uh, 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 evangelism easier, easier to understand. You focus on these few things. You don't have you have to be overwhelmed by all the rules and regulations that people throw at you. There's a few things to follow, and it makes it makes uh, the Christian life, the walk, easier. 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks for everybody for participating. Uh, yep. uh, the last thing I thought I'll leave you with is Sister Renee. Um, she she gave me several messages just before we're going to start, and she's uh, sobbing, and I, it's so sad. Yeah. She was not going to be able to participate tonight, yeah. and so let's just everybody just keep on praying for her. Uh, we need a miracle. Her condition is is not only diff, so difficult on her, but there it seems to be no solution. Right. So it's going to require a miracle. Amen. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right, Brother Cripps, th thanks again for participating. And uh, oh, yeah, I remember what I can't remember what we were talking about before we went live, but I wanted to. Oh, yeah, I remember now. I'll tell you, talk to you about that after we, we finish the live broadcast. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, join me uh, this Friday. Uh, I'm planning on interviewing Brenda Z Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Oh, good. Join, join us Sunday on uh, the uh, uh, Church of the Eternally Secure live broadcast at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Okay. Thank you for participating and bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.